This is part 2 of Sandra's testimony in session 6. You'll find the link to part 1 on screen in the description or in the playlist. It was just a, a daily living nightmare for mm-hmm. me for years and years and years. And it still is. I mean, as I said, you live with that for the rest of your life. And did your own second child uh, make a difference to how you felt about it all? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, to this day, I have a very unnatural relationship with my children I think because of it uh, I mean my mm. oldest is uh, 25 and he's still living at home and um, I dread the day that they leave the house even though they're adults yeah. I can't I I dread that mm. when they leave I'm going to have those same feelings I had on that fifth day in the hospital it's absolutely irrational but that is a deep set hurt inside of me and my children I am so protective of them like especially here now because they're the only family I have Mm -hmm. you know here so they're my life you know in America and um we are very 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 close and um you know they're very protective of me too but um I I can't imagine them you know I just even though it's the healthy thing for them to move out and do their own thing I have created an environment in my home where they probably don't want to leave. And that's because I've created that because I don't want to get to that point that I don't have my children with me. Mm -hmm. And have you had counselling over the years? Oh, I did. I did. I I got married um, very young. Uh, So a couple of years after I got here, I was already married and um, got pregnant and, you know, had, had my first son here second son I should say but my first son of my marriage and um, you know looking back the awkward moments you know when you get pregnant you go to the doctor you know oh it's your first child yes it's my first child it's so ingrained in you to Mm -hmm. say the things you're supposed to say and you know I think God I lied like that could have been bad like I already had a child like wouldn't he know I had stretch marks and everything else he was thought Jesus she's an awful agent she didn't know she had a child (laughs) you know um but I just, you just, you live the lie. You yeah. live the lie because my parents, even when I was here, you know, they knew people that were here. The same church that I grew up in was here. And, uh, you know, God help us all. If the word got out here, you know, would get back to Ireland that I had a baby. So it was never allowed to be said. So I kept that up even, you know, with the doctors and, and with everybody else. My husband did know about it. I did tell him, mm-hmm. you know, about it. And he was, you know, he was fine with all of that, you know. Mm. But, um, yeah, I ended up getting, I, uh, when my dad, my dad was, um, got quite sick, um, in the nineties. And so I was back and forth to Ireland. Of course, my five year period had passed and I was allowed to go home. Um, mm-hmm. so I had two boys at the time and I would take them home with me. And, um, at that time when we'd go home, I got to meet my son, mm-hmm. um, and he didn't know who we were. He knew us, but he didn't know that I was his mom. I was his mother. Mm-hmm. Um, so we developed a relationship, and he got to know my own kids. Um, right. But he never knew that they were his brothers, his half brothers. So um, that was there. So we were home several times. So when my dad died, my dad was very, um, I was very, very close to my dad, and uh, he was kind of the the matriarch of the family, mm-hmm. matriarch. <laughs> and um, very very strong individual but just a wonderful a wonderful person honestly he, he really was and um, when he died you know I felt like uh, everything was was just fell apart and mm-hmm. uh, I came back here to America and uh, the loss of losing my dad I think triggered um, yes. mm-hmm. the loss of losing my son and I ended up in the hospital um, you know, for a week in the uh, psych ward because I, I wanted to end my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even though I had, you know, two little kids of my own, it just, the the hurt that it, it, the loss brought back. And it doesn't matter what form loss comes in. It's still the same pain. Yeah. And, and no matter when I feel loss in my life now, it's the same pain. It brings back everything. Even though you do therapy and you think you heal and you accept it, those wounds, um, anytime you have loss, um, it opens those wounds back up again. And it's another person that's gone from your life, you know, mm-hmm. that, that you you don't get to, you, they're not part of your life anymore. So 
so my dad's death was was a huge thing for me. So after that, then I um, I went to counseling and uh, for for years, and um, you know we went through everything from me growing up in the restrictive um, religion mm-hmm. that I grew up in, um, how that made me feel about myself, the fact that I you know was sent away to an institution, how that made me feel about myself, the fact that I had no self esteem whatsoever. Um, that my worth was nothing. Um, I didn't feel like I was good enough. I lived in guilt and shame. And I brought all that into my marriage, you mm-hmm. know. And um, getting married young, it was very, very difficult on my marriage um, to have all of those um, insecurities. And um, and it brought a lot of problems. It brought a lot of problems. So um, counseling helped. It, uh, it was a lot about treating um, the child within you. Yeah. And um, and that that's helped that helped a lot. It helped me heal a lot. But um, the thing is, is that I went on from there then to um, uh, to help other to help other teenagers. I got a a, a very big interest in um, in helping troubled teens, and because uh, that's where my pain was. You yeah. know, it's like I felt like I had I had all of this pain, and nobody was there. Nobody felt it. Nobody acknowledged it. Nobody knew the pain that I had inside of me. And and then it was I went to school and I studied psychology and I studied all of these things. And I wanted to to be around um, teenagers that didn't have somebody that, uh, you know, in in terms of crisis and rape and pregnancies and all of this stuff. So Mm -hmm. I kind of dedicated a lot of of those years to... um, to helping other people and in some way it helped heal my own pain because yeah. I was helping them absolutely um, as they say it takes one to know one and so you were it does yeah. you had empathy for them and I uh, to this day I think it you know it um, I have an incredible heart for people that um, that suffer and um, that feel pain because I know what that feels like and uh, so I <laughs> anybody at all i'm just uh, that's i'm a magnet for everybody that has suffering and pain in their life so <laughs> right uh, something else what was the character and what has been the character and quality of your relationship with your son over the years well when um when he was about 13 or four, 12 or 13 um he wanted to know who his birth mother was and uh we were due home for um we were due home for a visit that year, so I went home, and um, they told, "Okay, you're going to um, you're going to you know meet your birth mother." So I remember they set up, a, I think it was somewhere a shopping center in in Dublin, and um, <clears throat> we were going to meet him. So I remember walking in the doors. Of course, you know from the time that you give the baby up, there's nothing else that you think about mm-hmm. than the time when you reunite with your child and in your mind you think it's going to be he's going to know that I'm his mum and I'm going to be able to take him up in my arms and take him home (laughs) and it's going to be that same bonding thing that you that you have in your heart for your child that that's going to be returned that's the kind of thing that you have in your head You, you think about nothing else but that first moment when your child accepts you oh it's mum hi you know yeah Mm-hmm. And um, so I remember we walked in, I was with uh, my husband, and uh, we walked into the shopping center, and he's there with his, um, with his parents, and, and he goes, oh, he's like, what are you doing here? Because, of course, he knew us, you know? And mm-hmm. I said, well, I said, I'm your birth mom. And he looks at me like, what? Like, couldn't believe it. And, um, and then he just, you know, hugged me, and and he's, he was thrilled because he knew my kids, and he was just so happy that he was now, you know, he was part of our family that he knew. And um, he was just, he was really, really happy about it. So from that point on, it was like, oh, my goodness, this is great. We'll have a great relationship. And um, a few years later, when he was like 16 or so, he actually came out here to America, and he spent the summer with us. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know... It was. It's very strange because I have this connection with him. He's my child. That wasn't there with him. You know, he saw me as, you know, his birth mom, but it was so far removed that there was nothing, 
there was no connection there mm-hmm. on his part. And it's devastating all over again because yeah. you have this whole thing in your mind that you've lived with for years and years that, you know, he's going to know. How could he not know? You know, how could he not feel what I feel for him? Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted him to, oh, I just want to come and live with you and, you know, be part of your life and and all of that. And, and that just never happened. Plus, the fact that he was raised differently than my own children. And, you know, so he had, you know, he had different mannerisms. He had different mm-hmm. ways of behaving than my own children. And so it was very clear that, you know, yes, I was his birth mother. But as far as me raising him, I, I was obvious that I hadn't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it was just, it was different. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, of course, it had a, a huge effect on my own children, too, because, I, I, you know, I had to tell them as well that that they had another brother. So I was very scared because I didn't, you know, when you tell your eldest that, then they're like, well, I'm not your first, you know. Yeah. So that was, that was all really hard. I mean, they had to accept him that here is this, you know, boy coming over from Ireland and, you know, he's my mother's first child you know mm-hmm. and and so they had to accept him and everything but and then and that was fine and they did there wasn't anything there you know that there wasn't any problems or anything else but um and then it just uh you know i always kept in contact with everything else but just over the years um it's just fallen away i mean he's 30 years old now he has a baby of his own and i've um reached out you know for the last year to try and get a hold of him and um there's nothing but you know when I think of it you know why you know because I I haven't done anything or acted any differently than than um, you know I have over the years I've always you know tried to keep in contact and yet I contact at a point because it's such a still an open wound that um, you know it's like it's it's like if it's out of sight out of mind like he's in Ireland so it's easier for me to just Mm -hmm. not think about it Mm -hmm. so you know, every six months or his birthday and things like that, that I would contact him. And, um, you know, I wasn't there. So, you know, it was just easier for me to put it out of my mind. So I think, okay, well, maybe I just didn't keep in contact enough. I don't know. But when I think of it now, looking back, you know, in his shoes, I think for him, the worst thing was that it was an open adoption. And, and I think why is because he now knows that my family never accepted him. Like, he was the shame. He was the result of my night of, you know, debauchery, whatever you call it. Oh, Jesus, I don't know what it was. But, um, you know, that he, he, was, he was the shame and the guilt. And, and they never, even though they knew, and they would send him money on his birthday, and he knew who my parents were, grandparents as they were, um, it was never out in the open. And so, from his perspective, I can only imagine, that, and he's never talked to me about this, but I, I surmise that, you know, how would I feel if I was him and there was a family that never accepted me because of the shame that it would cause, you yeah. know? Those are the, guilt that, the guilt that I feel and the shame that I feel, he must have felt, and as a child who never, it wasn't even his fault, he was the innocent party in all of this, mm-hmm. that my family never, ever accepted him. Um, you know, openly, never did. I mean, my mother tried to love him secretly, you yeah. know, but what does that tell you? You know, you're not good enough for us to love him. Our, our um, reputation, you know, to everybody else is worth more than you. And I mean, and that's, and, and that's the way I was treated. Yeah. Even though that's all that they knew, mm-hmm. you know, they, I, they probably had no idea the damage that they were probably doing to this child or to me, you know. They yeah. probably thought that this was the best thing and that was that. So then when my, my dad died in 96 and then my mother died in um, 2006. And he, so he was 19 at the time. And he came at this point still nobody knew. So 19 years, all in secrecy, the whole family. So my mother was waked at my brother's home in Wicklow. And um, you know, my son was up there by her bed, you know, and he's just sobbing. You know, because that's his grandmother. And um, my uncle came in, my mother's brother, and she go, he goes, uh, who's that lad there now up at, up at your, the head of your mother's bed, you know, crying his eyes out? And I turned to him and I said, that's my son. And he goes, what are you talking about? Your sons are in America. I said, no. I said, that's my first child. 
I said he was adopted. And um, and so, of course, the scandal started then, can you imagine, mm-hmm. you know, at the funeral. So I had to, you know, I felt once my mother was, I didn't even wait to was buried, probably a terrible thing to do, but I felt now that she was gone, that I was free to, um, you know, to accept him. Because I wanted desperately to accept him because I knew that's what he needed as well. He wanted desperately to be part of our family. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't accepted. Yeah. You know, I think that's the worst thing. When he knows, when he knew that our family knew who he was and had a relationship with him and didn't accept him as part of the family. Like, that must have been the most hurtful thing for him. So after my mother died, it seemed like that's when everything kind of started, um, the distance started, because even though I opened up and said, this is my son, I think at that point he, he thought that, you know, my brothers and sisters and everybody would accept him into the family, and now this is it. This is, this is where I move in kind of thing. This is where I'm going to be openly accepted. It never happened. And it may have been because I had to come back to America, you know, and I'm not there to make sure that he's part of the family gatherings Bridges. and part of this and part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then on the other hand, I think for my own siblings, it was it was hard for them too because, you know, I think they carried a little bit of guilt as well as to, you know, how it all went down. And and everything, so they didn't even want to talk about it or bring it up. So he was still something. It was a hurtful part of their life that they didn't want to acknowledge. And um, my nieces and nephews and stuff would would try and include him and in stuff and things. But I think from his perspective, it just wasn't. You know, he wasn't family, and that's all there was to it. And um, and then when my husband died in two thousand and eight, I remember talking to him. He said, oh, yeah, I'll be out, you know, I'll come out, I'll be there, you know, with you and everything else. And I didn't hear from him after that. He never came. And I didn't hear from him for nearly a year, I think, after that. And that's the way it's been. He hasn't... Mm -hmm. He's had a child, and I have a granddaughter, and I found out about it on Facebook. So I have no connection with him, and I, you know didn't know he didn't tell me about her or anything else so it's very estranged yeah you pointed briefly to the role of your mother in it and that it was when she died that you felt you could (laughs) name the game i didn't care about aunts and uncles and everybody else because at that point i wasn't even in the religion anymore you know it was my parents i protected i loved my parents and i did not want to you know disgrace them while they were alive i just didn't and that was what they believed you know that's where they were in their life that's what they believed wholeheartedly and you know i was not going to disrupt that you know for them i wasn't going to make life harder for them so but once she was gone and i i didn't it wasn't premeditated it literally was not it wasn't like oh god mom's gone now i'm going to take i'm going to make an announcement you know at the funeral that mm-hmm. wasn't how it happened at all it was just i saw him there and he asked me the question and i just felt free and it yeah. was the most wonderful thing to say that's my son that's yeah. my son. And um, and I think those words were one thing, but what happened afterwards was that, you know, it, it just falls flat because nobody else except the fact that he was my son. Yeah. And Ireland went on the way Ireland has always been. You know, brush it under the rug, don't talk about it. You know, it's um, just get on with your life. What are you doing talking about those kinds of things? Yeah. Yeah. You uh, spoke about grief in your own family. Has that reopened grief issues? Ah, oh, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, between losing my mum and dad and then uh, my husband in uh, uh, 2008 to a, a tragic accident and my youngest was nine at the time. I have uh, three children um, uh, in my marriage. And yeah, it was, um, it was devastating. Devastating. I'm, you know, so it's just me and my kids now. Um, I've been single since. Um, he died, and uh, because uh, and I may never ever get married again or do anything because I I fear the loss. I can't go through that again. I can't go through losing anybody else. I just can't. It's it's a reality in my life that I have a big problem with loss, and um, that'll probably not change no matter how much therapy and no matter you know how trained I am in psychology. It doesn't matter. It's there. It's a wound. You just it's a hole, and you can't fill it. You just yeah. can't. It's uh, uh, people leave, and uh, it's just a lot more, a lot more painful. You know, I'm very, very close. My relationships that I have with my friends, with my kids, is probably abnormally close. 
Um, I keep everybody very, very tight to me. Um, mm. I have a very open house where all of the kids' friends are all over, and they all call me mom. It's like I can't have enough kids. <laughs> and I know I'm compensating. I know. I have hundreds of people that call me mom. And um, it's not enough. It's just not enough. Uh, maybe this is the start of dealing with the past and transcending it. When my husband passed, I didn't have any... Um, any family here. I mean, they all came for the funeral and all that, and then that's, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I, you know, I'm a strong person. I, I'm a survivor. You know, when I look back, I think of the things that I've been through and I've survived and, you know, I've raised my children and we have a wonderful family and, um, you know, I'm blessed with all of those things. But it, I think with everything now coming to a head, you know, meeting Kathy and um, I was actually just reading something online and, and I read about Irish First Mothers and I thought, oh God, what's that? And I clicked mm -hmm. on it and it was about, you know, I, I listened to some things about some women that were at Dunboyne and, and I thought, wow, and I just, the tears came and it just opens up and I thought, oh my God, I'm like, I thought I'd healed from this, you know, and then they're just sobbing for days and it was just, I, it took me down into this very dark place and I thought, no, I can't. I can't. I just have to ignore it all. I just have to walk away, and I don't want to. And then, the more I read, I thought, okay, well, I this, these are women that have been through the same thing that I've been through, and you know, there's something that needs to be done here. There's a lot of women that are a lot worse off than I am that are dealing with alcoholism and dealing with uh, broken relationships and all of this, and have never been able to get their lives together uh, because of what happened to them. And I thought, God. You know, I can't walk away from this. This isn't just about me. This yeah. isn't about me. This is about every single mother that has been through what I've been through. This is every child that has been put into an adoption, um, you know, that was of no choice. And, um, you know, children that have never been able to reunite with their mothers, um, you know, all of those things. I thought, I can't now. I said, I, I am in this, and that's just my nature. And, um then just with following everything then that's been going on and, and catching up with everything that's going on in Ireland uh, with the government and and the uh, inquiry and everything else, um, it's brought a lot of stuff. I mean, there's been several days where I thought, I can't do this, I can't do it, I can't do it, you know. But yeah. um, I think through all of it, I'm hoping that there will be some closure um, to all of this. Um, if nothing else... You know, just, I just want acknowledgement, you know, that what happened was wrong. It should never have happened. Yeah. And just somebody to acknowledge that that happened, you know, and and um, and to acknowledge the pain, you know, because when somebody acknowledges what you have felt or what you've been through, it takes away that feeling of, um, you know, responsibility on your own part. Like, you do nothing but blame yourself. You yeah. know, well, oh, for God's sake, you know, that's just who I was. I was, you know, I got myself into that mess and I, I caused all of this. And, and you put it aside. But that wasn't the case. I was a child. Yeah. I was a child. I wasn't even an adult. You know, I wasn't. I didn't even know what I was doing. And I had no guidance. I had nothing. And just su such a traumatic time of your life. And there was nothing. There was no counseling. There was no help. There was no guidance. There was nothing. So how do you find the group? Oh, honestly, the group has been, it has been bittersweet. As I said, it's open wounds, um, but I think the, all of these things are necessary for us to get to the place where we can find healing. Yeah. And uh, But not just enough for us to talk amongst ourselves. I yeah. think we, because that's what we've always done. You know, when I, th when I thought of it, when I joined the group, I thought it was very similar to when I went to Dunboyne. In my diary, most of my diary is helping other girls that were there, um, comforting other girls that were there. Um, there was no mention in my diary about the nuns or anybody that was taking care of us, taking care of us, or anybody counselling us or comforting mm -hmm. us or anything like that. There wasn't anything. There was no acknowledgement. There was there was nothing. Yeah. And it was we were there for each other. Yeah. And so when I joined this group, I had the same kind of feeling. It was like. God, it's like we're back in 1987. Like, we have no voice, and here we are, you know, trying to comfort one another. You yeah. know, it was like that all over again. And I remember I was reading my diary one day, and, um, you know, there's a couple of things in there where um, a girl had come back, you know, she was, I think she was only like 15 or something, and she had come back, she'd had her baby, and then, you know, she 
I remember writing it was a lot of the in the diary was about emotions of how everybody was just crying all the time and you know um, the grief and stuff that they would have after they get their baby up and um, and then a couple of days later you know I wrote in the diary that the baby died and there was a burial for the baby and mm. I don't remember any of that but it was in my diary so you know there's just there were just horrible horrible experiences that these girls went through in this home and there was no comfort there was no nothing the only thing that i got i remember when i came home from the hospital and i went back down there they gave me sedatives sleeping pills yeah sleep your way out of it you'll be grand sleep your way out of it you'll be fine in the morning just get a good night's sleep that's the only thing the yeah. only thing i got was sedatives and and the girls the girls just hugging and you know trying to make you feel better and you know we were there for each other so yeah. when i when i joined the group i thought that's it but you know what that's not enough for me now no we we have to get we have to get beyond that and uh, you know this is 2017 it's time to wake up it's time to take responsibility yeah. and um uh, you know if this happened anywhere else if this happened in america could you imagine the inquiry that would be going on right now and and what wouldn't be accepted by the public so we can't sit down on this i'm just i'm not i'm not now i'm fired up it's like i have to get to the end of this i have to see a resolution i have to have healing for myself for my children for my grandchildren and you know i don't know if i'll ever have a, a relationship with my son you know if that'll ever happen i've accepted him that he's gone he's you know i i have had to think of him as dead in my in my mind because it's the only way that i can think of my life with him not in it yeah. so i just have come to the terms that he's he's gone and that's all there is to it mm -hmm. so that's that the dreams and hopes that you had of the reunion and the happy life and all of that is never come into fruition but that's that's the way life is it's just it shouldn't be that way but that's what happened and we have to live with it and um, it's just a, it's a terrible, grievous, deep pain. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, it is a dynamic situation. And uh, even you speaking is making a difference and opening things up. Yeah. Uh, despite the reluctance of the Irish state to face up to it, and even to an extent our society to face this issue, they don't want to face it really. Yeah, and I just, I can't understand that. I just, I can't in this day and age. Maybe because I live here, you know, where everything's very open and, you know, everybody talks about everything. I just, I can't, I just can't get my head around the fact that this is still going on, that it's a fight. You know, why is it such, is it about money? It's not about money. It's not about money. You know, it shouldn't be about money. You know, when you, when you read that, they're not going to address this and about this because... You know, it's cost them so much money in the past. Like, what the heck does that mean? But the fact is and as well that, you know, mothers here in Ireland, and I've seen the group grown from strength to strength. And, you know, oh. there's some very determined women in there that their voices aren't mm -hmm. going to be heard. But at the same time, the way I describe it is that, you know, we are the last group in the closet. This yeah. is the first time that I'm speaking publicly. Yeah, I, I never, ever even refer to stuff in social media yeah. about, you know, I rarely post about these things. And it's only recently that I do because I thought, why am I still hiding? Why do I still feel shame? And it's not, uh, partly it's shame and partly it's because I want to protect, you know, the, the parents who raised my child. I don't want them to feel bad about what they did because they didn't do anything bad. You yeah. know, we... We asked them and, and they raised my child and they've, you know, been great parents to my child. And um, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want them to think that they that was an awful thing that they were part of. But in regards to the closet door, we have the door about half open. But there's yeah. this big bunch of people on the other side and they're pushing as hard as we're pushing because they'd like us to stay in the closet. Oh, absolutely. They don't, you know what, it takes an awful lot, which I found over the years, it takes an awful lot of courage to accept things that are wrong in you, in others, you know, those that are being your family or close to you, whatever, but to be able to talk mm -hmm. about the issues, it takes a lot, of, a lot of courage. It's a lot easier to be in denial and say it never happened or to, you know, dismiss it entirely 
but for me, it's the first part of my healing. Um, you know, even just you know talking to you now, I know it's going to be public, yeah. and um, you know, deep down, I, I hope it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, it's for the greater good. It's for all the mothers. It's for all the babies. Um, yeah. It's for all the hurt that happened. Um, you know that that some of these um, things can be made right, and and these moms can can get counseling and get the support that they need and. Um, things that should have happened years ago that it would happen now and that they can start healing and get on with the rest of their lives. They shouldn't have to live in pain and in prison. They're yeah. still in prison. They're yeah. still in prison. In their souls, they're still in prison. They're still hurting. They're still um, grieving the loss. And you know, no matter how you repress it, it comes out in your life. It, it came does. out in my life. Yeah. Mm. Every time I have a loss, it's it's that, you know, those wounds are, are open again. And I have my own grandchild now and you know, I look at her, and, and we're so close, and, and but the th same thing's ho happening all over again. It's like, oh, my God, what happens if, you know, she doesn't want to be part of my life anymore? I mean, it's it's not even rational. It's not rational, but those are the things that I live with because of the things that happened yeah. back yeah. then. Yeah, and I'm sorry that we don't have a functioning inquiry here or a functioning process that could help you resolve some of the issues by being able to hear frank admissions of fault and error on behalf of officialdom, which is a, a necessary and vital part of the healing process for mothers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I do hope that this conversation has at least put you in a frame where it reinforces that you are among women who have been through it all and that what was done to every single one of you is wrong. We are. They're living witnesses of, of what happened, and yeah. um, it's not okay. As I said, you know, I always reference back to the things that happened in this country, you know, that they're still living with today, but they were legal at the time. Um, it doesn't make that they were right at the time, just because they were legal. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the homes and stuff that were open at that time, the fact that you were sent away, you couldn't have identity, you were sent to a hospital, you're not given any pain medication, um, you know, that you were, you were lesser than human. Um, you know, those things are not right and those that needs to be made right because that's the only way that um, these women can, can heal yes. and, uh, you know, and move and move on with their lives. You know, that's, they deserve that in, in the least. Yeah. That's yeah. the least they can do. And the fact that they're, they're not even giving them that voice is just, it puts more salt on the wounds. Well, I think there's quite a few of the mothers in the group that actually, they can never give us back what they took. And we want compensation. Yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever, it, whatever form it comes in, um, you know, uh, uh, is fine by me. Yeah. Um, but the first thing I want is acknowledgement. Absolutely. I want an apology. Yeah. I want, you know, that this was not okay. Yeah. That these things were in place, and I don't care. I don't even know to this day, like who paid for it. And who, you know, obviously being in the group, I'm more educated about these things because you live with your head in the sand all these years. That That's just the way it was. And, you know, learning more about it, that um, that these things were being funded by the government and it was, it was accepted by everybody to treat um, women as second-class citizens that were unmarried just because they had a child yeah. is not okay. Yeah. It's not okay. You don't, you don't treat another human being like that. Yeah. And... Um, and somebody needs to take a responsibility for that, and that's all there is to it. And I think that's going to be the start of us, you know, at least healing. Yes. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for those who have gone on and, and, and passed, and, you know, a lot of the, the public, uh, you know, sentiment came from, you know, all of the babies that were found at Tomb and everything else. Yes. Um, but we're, we're here, we're living, and uh, we're still living the trauma and the hurt and everything else, and... They're not um, acknowledging that, and that is uh, is grievous yes. to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is always easier to um, deal with the distant historical past, you know, when the people involved are not around, um, and that's been the problem. They don't really want to deal with the fact that it's gone on until recent years, and that there are people like yourself who are in the 40s and suffering severely as a result of what they experienced in the Irish system. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like they're just, you know, they're putting it in a, in a chapter in the history book. Mm. Oh, well, you know, what? this is what we used to do and this is what we were and it was all right, you know, and and sure, we'll move on from that. We're not and that we, way now. And, and we build monuments. And that's not the, mm -hmm. 
Well, you're shedding some light on it, Sandra. Um, and, uh, you know, considering what you've been through yourself and the impact it's had on you, the fact that you're so focused on helping others as much as helping yourself is an inspiration too. And I'd like to thank you very much for giving testimony. Thank you. It's, yeah, I, thanks very much. I mean, as I said, it's this is the first step for me. Thanks again, Sandra. No problem at all. Thanks a lot, guys. And Cathy will be back on Thursday of this week with our seventh and next Living Witness. I hope you can join us for that. Take care till then. We walk the road now road of darkness we walk that road to the very end we could not see before the sunset we could not see before the dawn the feel of strength now in your father's arm with no fear or no alarm i've come here to unlock your dreams Dispel the darkness, draw the light so near Don't close heaven's way Don't close it at all Don't close heaven's way 